the senator, while indoctrinated, could not explain his toxicity. You should not listen to men's rights advocates if you want to know what they have to say. Number ZZ9 plural Z alpha. Number ZZ9. I've seen such hideous in all my life. But then it's all of this, eh? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Like a furry torpedo to the jugular. This is Honey Badger Radio. Radio with Buddy. But the senator, while indoctrinated, could not explain his toxicity. Not listen to men's rights advocates if you want to know what they have to say. Number ZZ9 plural Z alpha. Number ZZ9. I said I've never seen such hideous in all my life. But then it's a lot of this, eh? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Like a furry torpedo to the jugular. This is Honey Badger Radio. Radio with Buddy. But the senator, while indoctrinated, could not explain his toxicity. You should not listen to men's rights advocates if you want to know what they have to say.
Hello and welcome to HBR Talk 302, How Did Western Suffrage Start? I'm your host, Hannah Wallen, here with Nonsense Annihilator Lauren Brooks and the personification of perceptivity, Mike Stevenson. And tonight, we're going to go back, way back, back into time. No, don't get the troglodyte song by the Jimmy Castor Bunch stuck in your head. We're not going that far back. Just medieval times. But uh, before, before we do that, we got to do what we got to do. As always, Honey Badger Radio dishes out a smorgasbord of thought-provoking discussions, and his experiences, both recent and long past, have demonstrated the provoked thoughts are fighting back. They've made it clear that for people like us relying on third-party payment platforms, are, uh, like Patreon, to fund our work, is uh, treading on thin ice, or building our house in the path of a rapidly growing wildfire. In light of this, we strongly encourage uh, our supporters to switch at least their support for us to FeedTheBadger.com, the most stable way to help us out. And if you want to tip us directly instead of relying on any social media platform's tip jar, the link for that is FeedTheBadger.com slash JustTheTip. And as always, the same risk applies to our social media platforms, which is why you should further provoke the thought police by tracking our thought-provoking discussions on HoneyBadgerBrigade.com where you can find your way to all of our content, as well as a link to feedthebadger.com in the drop-down menu at the top of the page. And with that, let's get on with the discussion. Um, Western feminists talk about suffrage in in England and nations that uh, started out as English colonies, uh, things that are influenced, basically, by English common law. Like the right to vote was something all men always had, given to them for no reason other than that they were men, and only women ever had to fight to be included in the franchise. And uh, this this couldn't be further from the truth. Um, to understand the issue and why it matters that women had such a different pathway to their voting rights than men did, uh, we're going to have a crash course in history that, before I started looking into the history of suffrage, um, I, I honestly didn't know jack shit about this, to be, to be fair. Uh, in the United States, in the school system, the public school system, um, we're not obligated before graduation to take world history. Or at least we weren't when I was in school. I don't think they are anymore. Uh, e- either we, uh, we take American history, but, uh, it starts a lot later than medieval times, because, uh, we wouldn't be studying the same group of people, um, but uh, in any case, so there there was a lo- there's a lot here that I had to go digging for, and probably the most difficult part of my journey is that stuff that was there when I looked into this maybe twelve years ago, um, discussing it on Reddit is a lot of it's gone, a lot of the old timelines are gone, and it became increasingly difficult to get the information I was looking for without having my searches for it, um, you know, and find things that I could link to on the internet, and not just things I would be talking about having found in physical books in a library, um, and still be able to link to something that wasn't Wikipedia. Like, Wikipedia dominates search engines now. You look something up, you want, you look for information on something, Google promotes it, mm-hmm. and it shows up first in a lot of other, like, if you look um, at DuckDuckGo, if you look at Brave Search Engine, if you look at Yahoo, it's, it, or Yahoo, sorry. It's still there. Um, by the way, Yahoo is still there. But, uh, it's uh it's still dominated by Wikipedia. Like everything is seems to be dominated by Wikipedia. And one of the problems that I have with Wikipedia is they essentially um value things that have been said by journalistic hacks over and above older sources of information, um, direct sources of information like if if a source of information is uh the autobiography of an individual they don't want to use that but if somebody writes a hit piece about that individual they will use that absolutely uh, <laughs> yeah so, and, 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 like, it's it's so, tough 
you can you can I don't know how what the process is because I've never tried to edit any information on Wikipedia, but that's absolutely possible to do. And I don't know what the uh, process is for them vetting that information that's trying to be, you know, updated or or adjusted or edited or whatever. But um, yeah, it's it, Wikipedia is not necessarily the uh, the end all and be all when it comes to your sources for information. Yeah, they just no. happen to show up first on the page. In, and, in fact, uh, um, not only not only is it not the end all be all, but it is often wrong. Yeah. I guess it's a bit like, or I would hope it's a bit like community notes on Twitter, because those are sort of uh, voted on by check marks of, of various. But Wikipedia is like if uh, community notes were able to replace the original tweet. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess it's, it's very different because uh, in, in Wikipedia, every, everything goes through the top end. Like anyone can edit these things, but eventually it, it goes through the powers that be the the top brass at wikipedia and if they get enough complaints from people they give a shit about namely raging leftists yeah then uh, the, they, they go in there and and veto any information they don't like but if you if you look at the uh, the wikipedia article on gamergate to this day it, it's an in, it's an entirely skewed propaganda piece Saying, oh, this is a harassment campaign against women and all oh, this bullshit. Even, even, even the Chinese equivalent of, of Wikipedia is is uh, far more fair uh, in in its appraisal of 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 what uh, of what Gamergate was. And it, and and this is you know the <laughs> fucking China. It's it's communism central, where where they control everything on the internet in 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 favor of of the communist narrative and even that is nowhere near as skewed towards this particular kind of communism as uh as the um i don't know what nationality to which you would tie wikipedia but uh yeah yeah it's, it's, it's far, far more communist than china ever has been on wikipedia <laughs> it's insane and it's it's not just political it's also they have some stupid things that they do, and we have some articles from, uh, you know, our our, our history um, in the Honey Badger Brigade uh, in the blog um, about the things that are wrong with Wikipedia. But an example I can give you: um, I have I have family members that are sort of niche famous in the medical community. Uh, for thing they did uh, last century, and it was the the start of the thing they did was set off by the decision of one of the family members in the household, and that that decision is something that individual made um, after an incident that took place and a discussion that took place with the rest of the family, and then the rest of the family. Uh, decided that, that you know this this was a good decision that we need to do and, and you know gonna gonna do this and and it set off a whole big change in a particular area of medicine, but initially there was that decision right, and the article there is a Wikipedia article about this occurrence because it did result in a major change uh, in in. Uh, that particular area of medicine. And there used to be, I don't know if there still is, but there used to be a note um, on the paragraph that explained the individual's reasoning behind that decision and what the event was that led, that de led to that decision um, that was something that, that, that this person described. I made this decision because X happened, and I witnessed it, and it was wrong, and this has to change, and so we decided to make this change. This was the conversation that took place. This is documented in the individual's autobiography, right? That was that was written by the individual when I was a kid, uh, and Wikipedia's note on it says that a that the, the source is too close to the individual and can't be accurate 
So, according to Wikipedia, if I go to the store, basically according to Wikipedia standards, if I go to the store to get a gallon of milk because we are out of milk, and I post a blog post about it, I went to the store to get a gallon of milk because we are out of milk, and something happens and it becomes famous and Wikipedia writes an article, somebody on Wikipedia writes an article about it, they cannot publish in Wikipedia that I went to the store to get a gallon of milk because we were out of milk and that was why I was there when the thing happened. Unless somebody else in a journalistic outlet they like writes about it. Even if that journalistic outlet references my blog post, that makes it credible. But me saying that that was why I was there, isn't. So I don't use Wikipedia as my primary source for anything. Um, I will use it as my diving board looking for sources. And the, the other thing that I've discovered is there, there are some articles that I looked into in other areas about other things where Wikipedia has a line and they'll have a little number, you know, and there's the source listed and it's a news article and it's actually online. So I'll go read the news article and keywords related to the thing they said are mentioned in the news article. But when you read the statement with those keywords, it says exactly the opposite of what the writer thinks it says. So they have things in there that are inaccurate because either the writer was stupid, which is a possibility. You always have to be open to that possibility. Or they deliberately lied. So either way, like, the biggest part of my journey was finding information and then double-checking it and confirming it, all without having Wikipedia pollute my search. Because I, I, I think of Wikipedia in terms of uh, information searches, as being not too far off from that big patch of plastic garbage that's floating in the middle of the ocean. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, which they are now having to be careful about cleaning up because there are actual living things growing on it, so now it's a habitat. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I read that recently, too. Not on Wikipedia. So just with that out of the way, that's why some, some of my sources seem like a little weird, and some of the information that I've found other places might have been easier to just grab from Wikipedia, but I can't do that. So, before we get into the actual show material, since we do have a super chat, I'm going to look and see, I think we probably have a super chow too, because we have our, our uh, one loyal user who always leaves us an initial super chow, um, which I can't find the stupid chat for it. Brain. Okay, so we don't have it yet, I don't think. Not yet. Okay, so our super chow that we have is from Catherine Scully, who says, Pair character exaggeratedly stretching his arm forward to offer a cup of coffee. <laughs> I need coffee, uh, especially for this, this show. This is going to be an interesting topic, by the way, because um, there seems to be this misconception about suffrage. Now that I've like gone on a 15 minute rant about Wikipedia and how much I hate it. Um, but there seems to be a, a misconception on the topic that women's voting rights were deliberately and willfully hindered throughout history by men, by the patriarchy. Um, and, uh, and I, we're, we're pretty much going to debunk the hell out of that tonight. So, let's get started. Um, I have, uh, I'm not going to, like, verbatim read my show notes, because they're, when I, when I put them in a Google Drive, there's like seven or eight pages to it, but I have quite a bit here, so, um, this, this journey, uh, is, was, was, was a bit rough. Like I said, um, so to our English colleagues in the movement, real quick, 
Uh, please understand this is stuff I did have to educate myself about because, uh, like I said, the American school system, history doesn't seem to be as important to them as um, politics and sex education. <laughs> yeah. I had to take sex education and I had to I had to um, take courses that, that uh, ended up inundating me with left wing politics, but I didn't have to take world history, which I think is a, today. You know, I look back at that and I think that is bullshit. Um, but uh, so I learned learned this all through, like I said, mostly my own research. So if if I've got anything in here that is wrong or incomplete that that you think needs to be expanded on, like there are details that are important to what we were talking about and I didn't mention them, um, please, please, please comment and say so because this is important stuff. Um, and, and feel free to comment in two places because we got, I've got this up. What you're seeing in the screen here, uh, is the Honey Badger Brigade blog, um, honeybadgerbrigade.com. In our show notes, there is a link to this post and, uh, you can also comment on this post. YouTube sometimes eats our comments. I don't know if, if you can comment on Twitch uh, Facebook might actually ban you for commenting about this. I don't know. Um, so, one place where you know you can leave your comment is the Honey Badger Brigade blog. And that includes, like, if you're a feminist and you think everything I'm saying is bullshit, you can say that there too. Um, and we, we may or may not answer, uh, and, and, uh, argue um, I will try to keep track of these comments, and uh, I will say thank you in advance to anybody who does comment. But uh, I would rather have people comment and say, no, you're wrong, this happened and you didn't mention it, or, or something like that, than misinform people. Um, so that's, that's one thing that's really important to me, because this topic sort of explains a bit about why it is not unreasonable for for uh, a lot of people in what is we used to refer to ourselves as the manosphere before the media did um but when we talked about it we talked about it in terms of a, a loose loose uh connection between different groups of men's advocates and men's issues discussions and and uh, uh activity surrounding men's issues um, it wasn't in, in like the grand conspiracy theory that the media is making it out to be now. Um, but generally speaking, there is quite a bit of muttering in the manosphere about women's suffrage taking a different path, much easier path. And uh, some people say, you know, women shouldn't vote. And I'm I'm in more in that camp than I was before. Um mm. And, and I've been more in that camp than I was before increasingly over the last few years as I learn more about why maybe women don't consider their votes as carefully as men do. Yes. So I've, they, I, I, I've, I've gone right over that hill and I'm, yeah. I, I've landed on the point that uh, nobody should have the vote. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to learn how vote, how the vote happened. So... It's, it's it's an interesting evolution because I think it was kind of inevitable that, that we would end up at this point. Um, but at this point, we definitely do need uh, to, to re-examine it. Um, that there is that. So you are not going to get kicked out of uh, the Honey Badger Brigade blog for, for arguing with us. Now, if you try to sell shit and scam people, that's a different story, right? Don't don't get on there and start selling psychic services and bull crap like that. Like that might get you deleted. But <laughs> but uh but you you know, you can tell me, you can get on there and tell me that I am absolutely full of shit and I will not delete your comment. So so there you go. Um but let's get into this, like I said, and we'll scroll down past that. Uh and pass the intro, and there we go. So the first thing that I want to talk about, um, and I I worded it specifically in the the blog as if I was gonna go through and read this, because when I first started my notes, I thought, oh, I'll have a few paragraphs, maybe a couple of pages, and we'll read through it. And there's a lot of information. 
Uh, and I, I, when I started reading about voting, um, I realized that I was starting in the middle of the story. And I had to keep going back farther and farther. And I finally landed on the Magna Carta, which is ancient history today. Um, so to talk about the Magna Carta, I have to talk about the worst monarch England ever had, at least Ooh. according to... Uh, <laughs> mm. A pox on that phony king of England. Yeah. According to everyone, even Disney... Like even when when even Disney hates you, you must be something. Something's really, like I don't know. Um, so uh, King John of England. Um, this is this is King John of Robin Hood legend, uh, brother of King Richard. Um, and and while there is a lot of the story that is just folklore, there were some things that were true. Richard really did run off to fight in the Crusades. Um, Richard really was captured, and John really did leave him in captivity to save money and stay in power. Was, so, was there a Robin of Loxley? N- not that, not that I could find anything about. I've I found some um some articles where they said we think this guy is who they were talking about. Um, but there's also articles about how. The name Robin of Loxley came from, and Robin Hood came from, um, terminology uh, about brigands in the woods that robbed people and stuff like that. And there wasn't in, actually in, a. In, in all likelihood, there were all kinds of, of yeah. outlaws all over the country, and 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 they just uh, so, sort of came together, presumably in Nottingham, because. Uh, there were lots of them in Nottingham, more so than in any other place. This is how legends occur, and it was a legend rather than a myth. Right. This is sort of the difference that a, a myth didn't exist. It's just a story that people tell each other. A legend is someone who might have existed, but we're not quite sure. But it's it, it's sort of very loosely based on 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 at least uh, a movement that did exist. You know. Yeah, and and uh, there was a lot of resistance to uh, to John's policies, and in particular his taxation policy, because he was an asshole. He was he was terrible. So, um, but we have to go back even a little little bit further than that to understand how the Magna Carta came about. <laughs> so, so we start with King John's father, Henry the um, Second. Henry the Second had. Uh, brought a lot of territory into England through um, his his origins and his marriage, and so he had like England had expanded, and some of that territory had previously been French, um, and and so uh, under John's rule, through his own decisions, it's like he, like he lost some of that territory. Um, to uh, to King Philip, and uh, in his attempts to get the the lands back, he uh, ended up spending quite a bit of money, and he he failed. He didn't get anything back, um, so he essentially spent a shitload of money, and then fell on his face. And on top of that, you had the cost of the Crusades, which was also bankrupting England. Um, you had, he had other things going on. He lived in the lap of luxury while the people, like, that was an accurate portrayal, um, in, in all of the, the various storytellings of Robin Hood, where it shows, you know, King John being rich and eating, you know, good food and having parties all the time. And like, that was, that was true. And, uh, he was also, like, right down to... (laughs) The Disney version was accurate right down to when he would get upset, he would bite his fingers. Um, that's That was mentioned in several places. Like that, that was... He wasn't a skinny lion, but he did do that. <laughs> um, so it was kind of funny. Uh, I, like, I, I, I'm dying because my only knowledge, of, really, of, of the Robin Hood uh, lore is from Robin Hood and Men and Tights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All I can remember is uh, Richard Lewis holding, biting his finger. Yeah, and it like that that and it was it's accurate. 
It, it, yeah. That's the funny part. It's accurate. It was it yeah. really did. And he was an asshole to other nobles as well. Like he went to, um, we'll, we'll talk more about Ireland later, by the way, our Ireland, um, in, in terms of the relationship between England and Ireland, the best thing that I could think of to say about it is that it fits into the, it's complicated category. Jeez, mm -hmm. Pete's. Um, but in any case, like when, when he went, he was sent by his father to Ireland to, uh, sort of try to make some connections and he was an asshole to the nobles there in the most socially awkward and dipshittish way like pulling on their beards and laughing at them and shit uh, you know but seriously acting like a spoiled child um really did not help the relations we'll we'll leave it at that like he he made things much worse um so he was he was an asshole Right, um, and he went to his barons after uh, after wasting all of this money, after not winning his lands and everything, and demanded more taxes, more money. We gotta fund this war. We gotta fund this. We gotta fund that. And uh, and they 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 were like, no, we're not gonna do that. We don't want that. Um, so, they ended up, uh, they ended up in a, a bit of a war there. They, they came out with a, um, set of demands. They, uh, wrote what is essentially the original version of the Magna Carta. And, uh, while it didn't create a citizen's right to, uh, vote, it established that, um, he couldn't just unilaterally raise taxes and he couldn't just unilaterally do uh, some other things that uh, you know he had to respect something called the Great Council and this was a tradition in the UK so you had your king and you had your nobles and you had this system where um, the various areas of the UK the nobles from those areas would come and have a meeting and representatives of the church in those areas would also participate in this meeting and they would discuss the heavy issues like taxation, new laws and policies and stuff and make their recommendations to the king and the king very carefully considered those recommendations. Those, these are things that, you know, he didn't just say, well, I want to do this so I'm going to do it regardless of what you guys say or do. Um, but, uh, King John decided he wasn't going to do that. He just um, did his his thing the way he was going to do it. So, um, well, which goes to show you, you don't need democracy in order to push back on a tyrannical king. You you, you just need uh, the next layer down, which in this case was the barons, because they realized they they had enough power over over their. Um, I don't know what the jurisdiction of a baron is. But so they yeah, had it, their own armies. Um, yeah, that, they had their own military. Thing. Like we're, I, 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 you wouldn't think of it as an army like today's army. It would be more like a militia. But they did have their own forces. Um, that was the other thing that was interesting. Uh, but reading about it, you had and and England and Ireland and Scotland all had sort of a different. And Ireland and Scotland were one thing originally. Yeah, it, was, it it wasn't called the UK at the time, by the right. way. I know you're doing that because that's what we call it now. But yeah, yeah, it wasn't called the UK until the uh, early 20th century, I think, or maybe later. right, right. Well, it was it was quite it was it was, it was, quite kind, it was kind of all called England at the time. Yeah. Um, well, well maybe, maybe not that far back. Um, yeah, Ireland was its own country um, yeah. throughout most of this, and uh, what what Americans think of as a completely separate group of people, the Scottish. Um, were Irish before they were Scottish. So, and there's there's a lot that I learned actually about my family history because my my family history uh, involves Scots. That, um, to my understanding, from everything that I've found in my digging, are from a branch of um, Clan Campbell that had to flee. Uh, 
Scotland under cover of darkness to avoid execution for their crimes. Um, <laughs> so my I, I come from a long history of, of uh, outcasts and, and um, socially awkward people, I guess. But and it's, it, much, it's <laughs> much the same in Britain. We, yeah. we like to think we like to think of ourselves as uh, ethnically separate people, but uh, we're, we're, we're composed of people who've been escaping Scotland and escaping Wales and escaping Ireland and escaping yep. England and just sort of running clockwise around these islands for thousands of years. Like, we're, we're genetically, there's no difference. Well, see, that's the other thing. My Welsh ancestors aren't Welsh. They're Scandinavian. <laughs> so, that, that too, yeah. yeah. But, in fact, I'm more Scandinavian than I am anything else. Um, but, but my, I, and I'd always been a little confused about, like, how could they just go to Ireland without, how do they just let them in? And, well, Ireland and Scotland, the people of Ireland and Scotland were one ethnic group. And there were things that happened in history. I'm not going to go through the whole history of that either because it would take all day. But um, they uh, uh, sort of split off to two different uh, sort of nationalities. And and then they also had their very complicated relationship with England um, and, and so on. But that – and that's, that's like way, way oversimplified. Um, but so my – my Irish ancestors that were Scottish before they were Irish were Irish before they were Scottish. So there you go. Um, <laughs> so no, Tyler Preston, I'm technically not Welsh. Uh, the, the, I, and I learned more about this um, by, by getting uh, a uh, medical DNA test and then also getting uh, my genetic profile, my like, genealogy profile from that but uh you know the 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 primary thing that i learned was that i have a medical disorder that really kind of sucks um which isn't really new news we already knew that i just had to have it on paper um and and which there there's uh like 13 or 14 different ways that it can be bad so we had to find out which particular type of bad it was um but uh, yeah, uh, ultimately, I'm mostly, my, m you know, my my history is mostly Viking, <laughs> and and oddly, I found out that I have a whole branch of ancestry that isn't accounted for in my on paper genealogy. So we'll we'll just let that drop, and you guys can figure out the implications of that. Um, if, if, if your <laughs> if your ancestry is from uh, Great Britain or Ireland, then it's likely uh, your, your, your Scandinavian heritage is a fraction of that. Because I, I I'm in that camp as well. Yeah. My my parents recently got uh, one of those tests, and it turns out uh, I think my my dad is two percent Norwegian, and my mum is three percent. Oh no no no. Uh, <laughs> Swedish. I'm a quarter. Which is, which is quite. Oh, oh really? Okay. Yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a quarter Scandinavian. And it's um, not all one country. But, uh, no, I, I have more Spanish ancestry than Irish. And that was the weirdest thing, because, like, I expected to be like, oh, yeah, Irish, you know, taking up most of the Venn diagram, and then the rest is, is like, you know, other things. No. So somewhere somewhere in my family history is somebody who claimed to be from somewhere they were not. Or something else happened. Uh, somebody, somebody claimed that somebody who was not was the father. Like those were the two possibilities that 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 uh, came to me as uh, you know, like ah, this this was caused by one of these two things. So, but in any case, yeah. So uh, all of that said, there was a lot of um, travel back and forth between the the nations and everything, uh, and. Uh, there was there were differences like England had um, it, England's feudal system was a king and then nobles. Ireland's feudal system was a great king and then kings and then nobles. So it was it was a little different. Um, but uh, in any case, the the UK government's history blog was a good source. Um, that uh, 
I found I found useful and then I also found a report that was written by an individual that was uh, published by the UK government uh, that, that gave a lot of information about this so medieval kings were basically here's how the Great Council is explained Medi medieval kings were expected to consult with and take advice from the leading churchmen and nobility of their kingdoms. Greater nobility were generally tied to the king through bonds of kinship, ancestry, and tenure. Um, and tenure being um, they they had a long-standing trusting relationship because of service to the king. No, you know, not just I met this guy when I was a kid and I've known him for you know. 30 or 40 years, or my father knew this person's father and their family's known our family for all this time. It was, there had to be something more than that. Um, sacrifice, uh, going to war for the king, you know, that kind of thing. Paying tribute, uh, and so on. Um, so, kinship, ancestry, and tenure. Uh, in post-conquest feudal society, the king's tenants-in-chief held their lands uh, of the king. Meaning, so you had the highest nobility paid the king rent for their lands. And that was taxation. Uh, they were considered to be the natural leaders of the kingdom. They had a right and an obligation to give counsel to the king. So it was not just... Um, when we think of uh, suffrage as, as a right, um, we don't think of it as an obligation anymore. In the in a, in the twenty first century and even in the twentieth century, a lot of people didn't think of it as an obligation. But it's your job to participate in the system of government, and this was an early sort of predecessor of suffrage, right? These are the people who were responsible for these lands. So if you were a, a lord or a baron, and you owed your fealty to the king, you owed uh, rent to the king, taxes to the king, basically, for your lands. And when he wanted to fund a war, or a building a road, or anything like that, it was this great council that he came to. It wasn't just that you got to say yes or no. It was expected by the people under you, the people who paid you rent for their little segments of land, and the people who worked your fields and everything that you would make a decision on their behalf and then go in and say to the king this is what would benefit me and mine the people of my land and this is what we want right and it was also you had authority to do that because you had that obligation it was your responsibility so Clause 14 of the Magna Carta uh, didn't create Parliament. It didn't give voting rights to the common man, but it codified into the law the fact that a set of nobles whose position came re with responsibility uh, for the people living on their lands must meet and decide together how to advise their king before he could proceed with new taxation. So that is sort of... My, my opinion is that that is the original voting right is these people would have this discussion and they would decide together that would involve everybody having their say I think this this is my and, and and my advice and when as a group they advised the king everybody's statements would have been taken into consideration so that's a proto voting system Lauren, were you about to speak? Oh, sorry. No, uh, I was going to say I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, competition is all is all you need. Yeah. yeah you, you get a, one guy on one side of the country saying I want this, and another guy in another part of the country saying I want this, and that's that's as much competition as, as you need. Like I, like I said, you don't you you, you don't need the. Uh, the farce of democracy in order to make this happen. You just need to splinter the uh, the absolute rule of, of a king. And you can still have a king, but you can uh, you, you can you can divide it between jurisdictions so that you have competition. And it's it's much the same as the 
principle of the free market. Um, just from uh, different uh, translations, I suppose, uh, as, as long as you've got people who can pull together uh, by disagreeing with each other. That's sort of how uh, competition works. You can, ha you can have a centralized power, but not absolutely centralized, nor does it need to be splintered all the way down to each individual. Although in theory, you could do that still without even involving democracy. Um, yeah. You could, you, you, you can splinter it down to counties, which I believe are controlled by counts, hence the name count counties. I'm not sure what the difference is between a count and a baron. They might just be uh, different variations of the same name. And you could take it beyond counties down to cities and towns yeah. and, and even, Which... even villages and uh, you can take it as far as you can from from there which is probably what i we do have, have some heard. definitions related to that in this we aren't going to go through i we might actually have to go through and read the definitions because this is old uh medieval speak for things that have modern concepts that we're not attaching it to but but yeah um I, I would say one of the biggest problems that has happened in the last two centuries in the Western world is during this time, you can see, um, during during medieval times, it was it was recognized that rigorous debate and uh, discussion, rigorous evaluation and analysis, were the important factors, the most important factors in reaching a consensus on what to do as a, uh, essentially, a commune, right? A national action, a, a village action, a city action, a county action, um, or, or, or a national action, right? But uh, now, we sort of substitute advertising which is not the same because that's propaganda and then voting for those things and and it i think that is part of why bad elements have been able to take over politics in every uh westernized nation because we've had this failure to engage in rigorous debate rigorous analysis of ideas and uh information and uh this is decision making so uh we did get a super chow from meredith meredith g gave us five dollars and said hbr talk 302 honey for the badgers as a person who actually majored in history in college the topic of suffrage didn't get covered accurately which is interesting to know um, I'm late on posting the Super Chat because I'm in the middle of letting the federal government in my state take money from me, which I, I, I know exactly what that's about. That means I'm filing my taxes and I'm about to write some large checks. Mm -hmm. Yes, when you actually have the government stealing from you, you want a say in how said government spends that money. And yeah, um, I will say it, taxation is theft. Yes, it is. <clears throat> Threat of force, right? Uh, so, so there you go. So, but back to, um, this, this history, this, this agreement's written up, um, John signed the agreement and then immediately, um, appealed to Pope Innocent to back him in declaring it null and void. I don't want to, uh, meanwhile, uh, on his own, Pope Innocent condemned the agreement claiming it was um, coerced and uh, forbade observance or enforcement of it. And by the way, also, if I uh, remember from what I read, he actually excommunicated the barons that wrote it from the church. So uh, it was, it was, it did not sit well with the uh, dictatorship of the monarchy or the dictatorship of the church. Um, the conditions that followed led to something called the First Barons' War, um, in which you know there there was actual fighting going on. Um, during that war, John got sick and died, and his 
nine-year-old son, King Henry III, became the monarch. And since he was nine years old, um, he didn't rule. He had uh, executors that ruled on his behalf. And um, they sort of, they made a bunch of agreements with the barons, but couldn't really enforce those agreements because they weren't the king. So everything sort of got put on hold until he reached the age of majority. Um, so there was that, that was going on. And at the same time, because England had a boy king instead of an adult man, um, you know, the Catholic Church interfered more, um, the French monarchy interfered more, because John showed explicit and extensive weakness, uh, to the, to the French monarchy. Uh, so... The, the charter was originally published... Let's see if I put the year down here. Yeah, I don't think I did. But uh, during John's monarchy. But it was republished... Um, in 1217. So we are... In the first quarter of the 13th century right now. Right, so voting is sort of a, there's sort of a proto voting system. The proto voters got mad and started a war with the king. Um, the king died and left a child uh, to be the king. And um, the the second king, his executors published the second version. The second version watered down the "you can't tax us without our permission" clause. Which, Americans should be paying attention to this simply because what was the battle cry for for the Revolutionary War? No taxation without representation. So, obviously something changed significantly between then and the American Revolution to make that a common attitude. <clears throat> so... A, a, a two-party system is considerably worse than a... Uh, multiple baron system <laughs> yeah but the tea say. party system was kind of fun <laughs> not not the two party system but the tea party system was kind of fun uh, so the other thing is it is it gave the the barons more authority over their feudal subjects uh so they had more things that they could do um but the taxes uh thing they they kind of backed off on that for the time being right and the document continued to evolve um, over time. So there's been multiple versions of the Magna Carta. But you can find those on the UK government's history blog website. And uh, among other things, like if you look it up, there are several places online where it's published. And there are different versions of it published from different time periods. And they'll say, you know, this is the this year publication of the Magna Carta. Um the document continued to evolve, but uh, two things in it um, are relevant to modern suffrage. One of them is the concept of council, um, which to me that was the first hard limit on a monarch's unilateral power, right? And and uh, that that first hard limit is the obligation of the monarch to respect consent or dissent of the people the monarchy relies on to govern segments of the country and see to the welfare of the subjects in those segments. So that's tied to responsibility and obligation. And uh, the the UK government's history blog of this says the idea of, of common council of our kingdom shows that the barons were thinking of uh, themselves as the embodiment of the community of the realm. So they weren't just voting based on their own personal interests, they were voting based on their obligation to the people, their responsibility for the people under them. Uh, the other is the legal establishment of the concept um, being very solidly drawn up in blood because they fought a war and the people under them who were their militias 
fought against the militias of the king. So their their fighting involved uh, men with swords, right, um, and fists and bludgeoning weapons, and uh, you know their body armor either had to be made of metal or animal hides or very thick padding um and and that was it you know men men on horses men on foot beating the hell out of and killing each other over this issue so this isn't just something that when we say voting rights are tied to military service it's not just uh the 20th century concept or the the 19th century concept of uh the the federal government, the national government, can enact some sort of selective service draft uh, conscription idea, and you all have to come and fight against some other country. It goes all the way back to the people of the nation fighting a war against the government of the nation and winning their right to vote by shedding blood. And getting blown up. Yep. So, uh, yeah. Men were getting... Uh, men uh, had to get blown up for the vote. In fact, they had to get blown up before they even had the vote. Whereas women got the vote by blowing shit up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. They didn't even have to uh, b- before you before you go, well, it's, sort of, it's even worse if you have to blow shit up in order to get the vote. They didn't, they didn't have to. They just... They, they, that's how far they went. I mean, they probably would have got the vote anyway, just by just by prodding the men and saying, "We want the vote, even though we don't have to get blown up." And they, it, would, it would have happened anyway. And it was just accelerationism, and 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 it worked. Whereas men have, have yeah, um, had to get blown up, and this wasn't. This was only centuries after they had to get stabbed to death for you know, centuries. Uh, it, not just to get the vote, but without even getting the vote. But even even the men who did have have the vote, the the noble men and what have you, even they had to get stabbed to death in order to have the vote, to some degree, uh, here or there, you know. Yep. Um, this was back when, uh, if if your nation went to war or your barons went to war against your king. Um, you know, you you didn't just see a bunch of guys sitting in an office. Like, they didn't have telephones. They didn't have radios. They didn't have uh, CB radios or anything like that, right? There was, there was no wired or wireless communication. Everything was somebody carting a letter on horseback to, to get to, you know, orders to the battlefield and things like that. Right? So if your king was going to give orders to his military. He didn't sit in his castle and give orders to his military. He was out there on the battlefield at the risk of his life. And if your barons were up against your king and you had multiple militaries involved, you had all of those guys out there. And it was all men. There were no women involved in this. So the question then is, you know, why is all this ancient history important, right? I got, I got, I, I, I can hear right now feminists going, well, they didn't actually call it voting rights, and they didn't actually do this, and they didn't actually do that. Well, it actually was the predecessor to Parliament. Um, the Great Council eventually got called Parliament. That is, it, it is the exact same um, thing, right? The exact same group of people doing the exact same analysis of ideas and debate eventually just started to be called Parliament. Uh, it's not the same as modern representative par- Parliament, um, but it is a clear predecessor. And uh, I found the information I needed to confirm this on Australia's Parliamentary Education official webpage which uh, cites 1236 as the first instance when a great council was referred to as parliament. And then it also gives a pretty concise description of um, what happened 
uh, next, one of the one of the incarnations, I guess you could say, of Parliament and this this uh, relationship between the monarchy and the next level down of nobles. Um, King Henry the Third, as, as as he got old enough to actually be the decision maker and not have his executors making his decisions for him in his name and and hoping that he would maintain what they decided um which more likely than not they would have expected him to simply because you know you, you don't want to go back through like six or six or eight years of decisions made on your behalf um i'm sure they didn't wait till he was 18 because i doubt that 18 was the age of the majority back then considering you could get married at 13 um but uh in any case um he repeated John's mistake of continuing his conflict with the barons, being heavy-handed, um, spending issues, and so on. And because of that, the Second Barons' War happened. And again, I'm, I'm going to give you the caveat. This is a really brief description of something that was much more big and complicated than all that. But what's relevant to voting rights is that that is, is what happened. So they have this Second Baron's War. Uh, Simon de Montfort gathered a parliament um, during during this time. And this was not a long event. This was a fairly short event. And we are skipping forward in, to this event taking place in 1264. Uh, so we were at 1217 in the first quarter of the uh, the the... 13th century. We are now in the third quarter of the 13th century. So that, there's a big jump there of history that isn't necessarily um, dramatic enough in its influence on this to, to talk about in this show. Uh, so people know I'm not just like skipping important things. Um, it's not that it's unimportant. It's just that it didn't it doesn't change anything. I, I, I could go over that whole time and it wouldn't change anything. Um, but one big change in um, de Montfort's par parliament was that unlike previous great councils, which were just the nobles and the clergy, he asked commoners to attend. That was unheard of previously. Um, so... That was the the very real predecessor of modern parliament, and uh, like I didn't I didn't understand the division uh, divisions in parliament today until I read this, and I realized that the reason there's a House of Lords and a House of Commons was because of this parliament happening. The United States we don't have nobles. We don't have we never had a monarchy as a nation. We were we only had a monarchy when we were colonies of England. So we started out with a, a complete rejection of the idea of commoners and nobles. And so our our um, two branches, our two legislative branches, are both commoners because all of us are commoners. We only have commoners, you know, if you want to put it that way. Apparently, uh, George Washington was given the offer to be the, uh, the, the king, king yeah. of the United States. And uh, I, I guess it was, um, I, I, I say this ironically, noble of him to say, no, 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 no. I, 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 would, I would never accept such an accolade. But you have to wonder how history would have played out if he had said yes. Yeah, things would <laughs> have been different. <laughs> He was a good yeah. guy, you know. Yep, and I mean, I mean, it would have been if we went with an ancestral monarchy, right? Like uh like most places none of the presidents that were president throughout the history of the United States would have served because it would have all been the descendants of uh of uh, George Washington. So I don't know. I don't know how that would have gone. Um, but I do know this. It's not what we did. <laughs> it's 
the, what our our uh, forefathers did. So uh, so our history is as it is. But we won't get into U.S. history in very much in this episode because. It happens much later than this. At this point in time, there was no United States, right? There was, there weren't even colonies, I don't think, yet. There might have, there, there were, there were, um, they were, they were starting to colonize the United States. There was travel taking place at, at this point in time, either this point in time or, let's see, because we had four hundred years of colonial history before. Uh, before uh, the Revolutionary War, so I have to go back and look at that. But um, in any case, yeah, we're we're not we're not going to Salem. Um, <laughs> Salem has little to nothing to do with. You know, wa- watch me find something in the meantime that I have to talk about Salem. Um, but in any case, let's see here. So the Parliament um, that Monford created, like he he was uh, killed in battle. Just a, a couple months later, uh, by um, the son of Henry the Third, Edward, who is uh, you know sort of next in line in in discussing the vote here, uh, but it is considered a pres- uh, predecessor of modern parliaments because it included commoners. So the interesting thing about this is this is sort of where um, commoner. Not so much commoner, but uh, community voting starts taking place, because if you're going to send commoners to to Parliament, you have to have um, a community decision who go- who goes to Parliament. Who's who's the commoners that are gonna gonna head out? So this is when local elections expanded the concept of common council from the nobility and the clergy to commoners uh, via their elected representatives. And again, the right of ensuring the decisions of the monarch um, would uh, rely on consent or or dissent of men in in positions of responsibility very solidly written in blood. This was, when, when they call it a war, this was not a big argument among people, there was fighting and bleeding and dying and permanent injury and you know, killing, maiming and spindle, uh, spindling and mutilating and all of that um, taking place where uh, men men suffered for this and died for this. And uh, there's another consideration that needs to be discussed um, that I didn't really find a whole lot of discussion about it in the literature, but this is a historical fact that I think anybody who wants to dispute this is going to have to find me something that shows I'm I'm wrong about this. Um, but and and it's, it's something I think a lot of modern people don't think about, right? So if I want to go to California today, I I can hop in my car, my van. My van's not in good enough shape to get out there. I'd probably rent one. But hop in a vehicle that's in good shape and drive myself out there. When uh, Kennesaw University, uh, when we had a um, an event down there in Georgia, you know, I'm, I'm in Dayton, and I drove myself down to uh, Kennesaw University for this event and uh, spent the night down there. And then drove myself back um you know and it, it's like a several hour drive in a vehicle that had um you know it's it's an enclosure it has heating and air conditioning uh when it when it's rainy i don't get wet when it's cold i don't get cold when it's too hot i can cool off um i can i can drive it with one hand, it's an ill-advised, but I can do it, right? And I don't have to worry that somebody's going to drive up beside me in another vehicle and force me off the road and steal from me on I-75 driving to or from Georgia because there's enough patrol 
that um, people would be afraid to do that. They'd be afraid they would get caught and busted and jailed for it. So, uh, uh, you know, where I live, and then, and if, if something goes wrong with my vehicle, right, if I decided to not take my own advice and drive something that, that wasn't in good shape for some reason, um, and uh, it breaks down on the side of the road, I can whip out my my uh, phone and call for help. And I can call police for help. I can call a tow truck for help. I can contact my husband and let him know I'm okay. You know, um, all, all that kind of stuff. Uh, if, if there's an accident and I'm injured, I can call for help. Or if I'm unconscious and somebody sees me, they can call for help. And if nobody calls for help, there's enough patrol taking place on I-75 that somebody who will call for help will eventually find me. Like that's the conditions under which we travel today. That's not how it was during the time period we're discussing. So if you wanted to travel across the country to go participate in this meeting, you walked or you rode a horse or you had a carriage and a driver. And, uh, you know, obviously the cheapest way to go is walk. Um, very dangerous. Wild animals could get you. You know, brigands could get you. Uh, you might get kidnapped because you're, you're uh, of a noble family, and noble families can pay ransom. And if they don't, you might get killed. Right? The weather could kill you, or at least make you very sick. You know, you could get injured, and if you did get injured, nobody might find you for days or weeks. There was no way to call for help. You didn't have phones. You didn't have any kind of communication aside from sending a person. Right? So, travel across country was very dangerous. It wasn't something that you just undertook lightly. And the more safe you made it by adding more people to your travel party, um, or adding more luxury, like a horse or a carriage, it became very expensive. So it was an expensive burden to travel across country. Um, and then on top of all of that, you also didn't know how illness happened, but you did know that traveling made it more likely for you to pick up illnesses that were not happening where you were from. So, essentially... Travel travel took place at extreme risk to the traveler. And the further you were traveling, the more of this extreme risk you were experiencing. Um, it's exactly the kind of dangerous thing. Women were not excluded from it. Women could travel, but they didn't have to. You know, Unless there was something going on that specifically required the woman to be in another location. Uh, you know... Um, her husband died and she had to go back to her family, uh, you know, or some, some such thing like that. She and her husband are moving, which wasn't exactly a norm, um, you know, or, or some unusual thing happened to cause her to need travel. Uh, you know, unless she was very rich and she could afford to make travel very safe for her and... She was of the type of family where her personal guard, which was also very expensive, uh, carried with it a level of authority that made people more afraid to attack her caravan than, say, uh, a merchant caravan or a commoner caravan uh, going to or from someplace. Um, women weren't necessarily going to take this risk very much. Which is, you know, the reason why representation wasn't something that excluded women by sex. There wasn't some law in place that said women couldn't go, women couldn't participate in this. Um, women didn't have to. Women weren't obligated. The expectation that women would take the risk was not imposed. It was imposed on men. So, 
when feminists talk about the patriarchy keeping women out of the vote during this time, they are so full of shit that you could grow a garden on them. <laughs> right? This was this was an obligation on men in positions of responsibility, not a man's right from which women were arbitrarily excluded. Right. So here is where I start to get some interesting information. In 2013, there's a paper written for the UK Parliament's Research Briefings Online Library titled The History of the Parliamentary Franchise. Um, Neil Johnston explains in this paper, before 1430, uh, 1430 is unique for another reason, but before 1430, there is evidence that the right to vote for the Knights of the Shires in English co uh, county elections, Shire is older English for county, um, was given to every free inhabitant householder, freeholder, and non-freeholder. There was no requirement for freeholders to be landed freeholders. The freehold could relate to something other than land. Hey, Tyler Preston says crap is more useful than feminist. That is true. Uh, so, so essentially, what he's saying there is there wasn't a law that barred certain groups of people from voting based on their gender. And that's what it says in the next paragraph here. No exclusion codified into law for women. There is a supposition, and this is something I found throughout my, my research, like a, a bunch of different sources um, would suppose or presume that women were excluded by tradition. Right? The supposition that local tradition would cause the same exclusion. But none of them had any kind of reference to any incidents, any writings, any anything that proves that women were excluded from voting rights. There was a document uh, found in 2013, I think a little after that blog post was published, um, pertaining to 19th century elections that indicates that tradition might not have been as exclusionary as people might think. So, when we talk about this, I'm not going to assume that women never voted in these elections, because uh, there's not... I couldn't find any evidence that, that solidified that. I could only find evidence that voting took place, and what the stipulations were. Um, the stipulations themselves may have minimized the number of women who would make themselves eligible for this type of voting that would take on the responsibility. And at these times uh, in the in the 13th century and 14th century, um, voting rights were still not seen so much as rights. They were seen as obligations. So uh, Johnston explains two basic types of voting franchise, county and borough. Um... So uh, here, here's where the vocabulary lesson comes in, because I, I'm like, borough is included in the names of a lot of communities in uh, the United States, but never really, you know, or burg, um, not borough, it's burg. Uh, same same word. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. But. Uh, and it there's an older version of the word burg that is shorter. Um, and that is borough, but burg, yeah, they're both they're both uh, in town names. So in medieval England, um, that's an urban center identified by a charter granting privileges, autonomy, and as the concept developed, incorporation. So it's an autonomous corporation. It uh, functioned outside of the hierarchy of the shire which basically means county as the next definition shows and something called a hundred so it was a village a town or a city a burg or a borough was a village a town or a city um in the definition i have here for shire 
uh, one of the things that's important to understand, um, it was a, a shire would contain more than 100. Um, it had an alderman or elderman, a sheriff. Um, it, uh, it was replaced after the Norman Conquest um, by the French term county, and county is a French term. A uh, hundred is a unit of English local government and taxation. So there's where that taxation comes in. So your voting rights being determined by your borough, your burg, or your shire meant they were de determined by your unit of taxation. Um, and it, uh, it generally originally meant a group of 100 hides, like H-I-D-E, like the animal skin. And a hide mm. was basically a farm. Um, the land necessary to su support a free peasant family. Mm -hmm. And the farm was the earliest basis uh, of taxation and also for mustering the primitive English militia known as the feared. And uh, the feared was a militia-like arrangement existing in Ang Anglo-Saxon England from approximately A.D. 605. So by the time the concept of parliament came around, we're, we're about 600 years, a little more than 600 years later uh, than the origin of this concept. Uh, it imposed military service on every able-bodied free male. Fines imposed for neglecting the feared varied with the status of the individual. Uh, landholders, who were more wealthy, right, receiving the heaviest fines, and common laborers, like serfs, who might own nothing and, and like it, I guess, uh, they, they received the lightest. And I have a link, so if you want to see more discussion about the feared, um, find that paragraph in that post. And underneath it, there's a link, the Anglo-Saxon feared, uh, to, to read about it. But what these definitions are important to, in term, besides understanding the, the, the discussion, because the dis discussion is going to include these terms, is the connection between them provides an understanding of the very solid connection between land division, land ownership, men's obligation toward the community, and military service. Uh, something that we want to bear in mind as uh, as we keep reading here. So, service is, is the important word there. Yeah, service. Um, like 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 I was like I was saying earlier about uh, George Washington and the like, and um, um, I, I, the worst thing you can do with power is to give it to people who want it because <laughs> because yeah. that's what that's where corruption comes from indeed absolute corruption and 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 this is uh this is one of the biggest problems with democracy it, it, it gives power to people who actively seek it they they campaign for it and it's it, it's it's just asking for trouble whereas uh the the idea of uh of of, mon of monarchy of power that is handed down to a baby <laughs> like the one of the first things they learn is that you know you have to lead this country doesn't matter if you want to or not you have to do this that's when the ruler becomes uh not a, a, a power hungry bastard but uh someone who has to do it i.e a servant and I mean, I, I guess they have options to abdicate, or or or, or at least to to pass down these responsibilities to, let's say, barons or, yeah. or 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 counts in the case of counties or sheriffs in the case of shires. But it, it it's I and I, I know it doesn't make sense to those who have lived through hundreds of years of what they call a republic, but. Um, what you really want is is 
for for the people in power to be servants rather than tyrants and and how how do you achieve that you make them do it uh uh by something like a bloodline you kind of say well i don't care if you want to do it or not you have to it's it's much like with jury duty this is why to this day we still we 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 give the uh the power of and the and the responsibility of jury duty to people who don't want it because mm. because uh, otherwise you're going to get power hungry bastards uh in, in deciding who who goes to hang and who goes free which is kind of what we have under democracy <laughs> imagine <laughs> because, <laughs> imagine how imagine. us history would be different if instead of our, our our political system being you decide to run for office and then you campaign and people decide whether to consent or disagree uh, to dissent and, and they vote for or against your campaign and either you get in or you don't. Uh, imagine if instead of that you get a jury selection type system where hundreds of people are asked to respond and then initially dozens of them are eliminated based on disqualifying factors and then a small group of them uh, present you know this is this is the way that I will handle things if I if I have to do this job um, and and then people decide whether they they like you or not and vote for you um, that would be that would be very different because people there'd be people like me that would get caught up in that I I will you know I don't want to run for office I don't want to be in that position I don't want to make those decisions for everybody else um, and I don't feel it's not that I don't feel qualified I don't feel <clears throat> I don't feel entirely uh, I don't feel like I have the aptitude for it. So my mom did, and my mom didn't get up one day and decide she was going to run for city council in our community. She got up one day and she decided that she was going to engage in activism in the community to get the park in our neighborhood fixed up. And she gathered people together and community organized, and she did that, and then she was done doing that. But then when the next election cycle for city council came along, the local Republicans did not have a candidate for the ward that we lived in. And there, everybody was like, well, you know, this woman did this. Look at this park. Look what it looks like now. Two years ago, it was a vacant lot full of broken glass and trash, and nobody could go in there, and uh, people's kids avoided it, and so on. Let's go talk to her. And they did, and... Initially, she was very resistant to the idea. I don't want to do this, you know. But then she talked about it with my dad. And she talked, we had a whole family discussion about this. You know, is this something that would be okay for the family? Is this something that the the kids are willing to sacrifice for? Because the kids are the ones that are going to lose a little time with mom. Um, is this something that we are willing to uh, accept? And once the whole family was on board with it, then she agreed. Um, she was running unopposed, so she was agreeing basically to serve. And she still had to do all of the legwork of registering for the election and, and um, proving that she was eligible and all of that. And she still had to get on the ballot, which meant she had to canvas the neighborhood and get people's signatures to let her run. But once that happened, you know, she was pretty much in. And she ran unopposed that, that election, and then she, she went on to run for um, the at-large seat the next time around because there were things that were going on that needed addressed. And she realized, I can't do the job for the ward without being able to do the job for the whole community because of these things. Um, and then, then she ran for president of city council, 
for the same reason. And then that was the end of her political career. She was done after that. She didn't run again um, for for years and years. And uh, that was that was how she got into it. She didn't get into it because she was like, I want to be in charge. She got into it because somebody else came along and said, we need somebody to do this job. And she did a good job. Um, in fact, she was the only person who was reelected for a position after um, our, our little small town controversy when we had a man falsely accused and fired from a position when he should have been promoted uh, in the police department. And um, she basically saved that guy and our police department and our community from from some serious wrongdoing and the fallout from that wrongdoing. Uh, so it is important um, having the community come to you as much as having you come to the community. And our, our system is not... Um, there isn't a perfect system, right? Our system is definitely not the worst system out there, and it's not the best system out there. But it would be interesting if... In order to run for public office, you had to be drafted into it, and uh, and to not be able to find a way out of it, uh, even though it might interrupt what you're doing with your life. Like I wouldn't want to stop what I am doing, right? I I the people that I take care of, um, I don't feel like there's somebody else that would just step into the position that I fill right now and do the same things that I do. And I, yeah. would, I feel like they would suffer because I was gone, and I would worry about them. I, that's the kind of thing you need to have in mind um, to be a good public servant. Uh, uh, you run this business, you have this job at this local place that, that uh, you have a clientele that depends on you, or a customer base that depends on you. Um, your life in this community is important, and the community is important to you. Uh, that's you know that that's more important in my opinion than wanting to serve. But but yeah, so um, service being the the operative word, uh, according to Johnston's description um, for sending people to uh, Parliament back in the the. 13th century and 14th century, um, or back in the 14th and 15th century, really. Uh, aside from legislation to address corrupt officials by bypassing the election process, um, nothing changed from pretty much n no regulation to uh, 1429. And uh, in 1429, there was a position, a petition, and in 1430, there was actually a law passed. Um, the complaint essentially was that uh, poor people were voting on what was viewed as the uh, pretense of having an equal voice to that of a knight or an esquire. So we talked about um, the the obligations and service and so on. Right. A knight or an esquire had obligations that that your commoner, the the literal filthy commoner, the serfs, the people uh, depicted in Monty Python and the Holy Grail as harvesting mud, harvesting filth. Um, you know, like those guys didn't necessarily have to report for military duty. They didn't owe any particular service to their community. Um, they lived on land that was provided for them by their lord, and their, they paid for it by working in his fields. Uh, and, and then they might also have other work they did for their own uh, income and, and uh, provisioning. But they didn't have... If, if there was a call out for... Uh, people to fill in military roles to go fight a war against France for some stretch of land on the border between England and France, um, they didn't get called up for that. And uh, 
and they also there were a lot of other rights that they didn't have as well so they didn't get a vote well, they initially did but this 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 changed things according to Johnston the petition called for the vote to be um, restricted <clears throat> to those freeholders resident in a county with a freehold value of 40 shillings a year which was basically the cost of a year's rent a freehold was not restricted to land it could refer to many types of property so think of it as let's say you were a cab driver um, in modern modern times and you owned your cab uh, maybe you owned a cab company and you made the same amount from um, your cab company that my landlord makes annually in in rent payments you would qualify under this standard um, I don't know about what types of property this referred to back then but just from modern a modern perspective that's basically when it says it doesn't mean you had to own land uh, it, it does mean still that you had to make that much money so you had to have some sort of financial endeavor that made you that level of responsible basically um, the petition led in 1430 to such a statute being passed and all leaseholders so me being renter um, that doesn't have uh, that type of earning from something I own uh, regardless of the value of their leased land were stripped of the vote the 40 40 shilling resident freeholder requirement for the county franchise remained until 1832 which we won't discuss the legal change in 1832 in this episode I hope I think we'll probably get to we'll get that far in the next episode but we won't uh, we won't discuss that in depth tonight but that's how long it lasted um, the interpretation of what uh, constituted a freehold changed over time, but aside from that, that was the that was the county standard. Uh, the University of Nottingham uh, defines a freehold, so people understand what that is, as land held in fee simple. Uh, freehold land was owned absolutely by the owner, who was able to sell it, pass it at will, or settle it dot 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 there's more to that definition and it's um, linked and then Britannica got dot com adds that the term originally designated the owner of an estate held in free tenure who possessed under the Magna Carta so again the Magna Carta affects your voting rights based on the, the what was what was laid out in it the rights of a free man a freehold was distinguished from non freehold estates and in order to be a, a owner of that type of land that was free in that manner so it wasn't land you were renting from a lord or a baron um, you you had to do something like be a knight provide knight service to the king um, Frankel Moyne uh, Frankel Moyne was um, a religious thing so you basically like donated your land to the church or you did a service for the church uh, in that was equivalent uh, and uh, or or you had um, you paid taxes uh, free soakage which involved certain services of um, farming manual labor um, so you basically earned the land through service and uh, that included military service um, for for the the Americans who don't speak English, um, especially middle middle age English or uh, medieval English, uh, soakage was land tenure in which the tenant lived on his lord's land and in return um, did an agricultural service. So you you basically uh, earned your land through uh, through soakage, um, and <laughs> you got soaked. And of course, in feudal society, lords were the individuals who held land from the king. So the king was the the um, owner of all of the kingdom. Lords were responsible for those sections of land. They managed that land, and they provided military service to the king. 
So again, we're looking at these rights being directly associated with military service. With service to the king. Not, you have the right to vote because you're special. Because you have a, a you know, something hanging between your legs. Right. <laughs> Not how the hell it worked. <laughs> you had to do something, you know. Yeah. And, I was going to say earlier when you were talking about the statues, um, you know, well, you were talking about, uh, um, you know, the men that did service for their countries and, and that's why they were recognized. And that's why that's what's so offensive about them trying to take these statues down. Like you don't even know the work. You don't even understand the history. You don't know the work that these men did for this country but your first reaction when you hear something that your uh, whatever teacher in college told you <laughs> is, uh, oh, my God, we have to burn it down. We have to take it down. What, what does that do? It does nothing. It just it doesn't even does it even alleviate the frustration that you feel. No. <laughs> no. And the, the, the people that. They are whose whose honor they are tearing down. For the most part, they're tearing down the honor of dead people who do mm -hmm. not care because they're right. not here. Right. <laughs> so they're they're trying to tear down the remembrance of that honor. Right. Lords, for instance, they were they had their service to the king. Right. They had their service to the people. They were responsible for providing protection for their subjects, maintaining law and order, and collecting taxes. So they had they had to be the guy that nobody liked, you know, when it came to tax collecting. And they also had to be uh, the the person who created the system in their area to reduce the the chances that people tra traveling through their lands would be attacked by brigands and robbed. You know, um, so yeah, the, they're, what we're, what's being torn down in that situation is our ability to remember this. That mm -hmm. it wasn't just um, a bunch of old men, and, you know, old white males making decisions and uh, speaking in, in snooty tones and, and going back and dropping new laws on the people and the people just obeying them and, and uh, voting rights being handed out to men like candy and blah blah. No, there, there was a whole system of, of blood and sweat and death associated with it that resided on male obligation. So let's see. So the 40 uh, sh shilling franchise of 1430 established that voting rights in county elections, which uh, were to send county members to parliament, were to be limited to only those earning 40 sh shillings annually in rent from property earned through military service to the crown or similarly dedicated service to the church. Um, as Johnson explains, the 40 shilling resident freeholder requirement for the county franchise remained until 1832, although the interpretation of what constituted freehold was extended in the intervening years, and the residency requirement gradually became obsolete. He further points out that this gave a whopping 1.35% of the population voting rights. So when feminists act like all men had voting rights going back through history and they withheld them from women, remember that when voting was first a thing that commoners did, that non, you know, non-members of the Great Council did, that, you, that people did to send commoners to the Great Council and knights to the Great Council, the people involved in that process constituted 1.35% of the population. Uh, 
Let's see. And he explains in 1831, just before reforms of the great, uh, the reforms of the Great Reform Act, Middlesex had a population of 1,358,330 people and an estimate estimated electorate of 3,000, or 0.22 percent. But in Herefordshire, uh, Herefordshire, the figures figures were estimated 4,000 voters. Uh, from a population of 111,211 people, and uh, that's 3.6%. So we're looking at essentially 95% of people definitely could not vote, and of of the remaining 5%, it might range from just under 4% to less than 1% of the population being eligible to vote, depending on where you're from. And that's the county franchise, right? Borough franchise, uh, Johnston found no set criteria, no uniform franchise across the nation. So if you lived in one city, you might have a different system than another city. And uh, so there were, what he found was like a variety of types of franchise that he put into categories that, that um, you know, most cities and towns would fit into one of these categories. They did one of these things. Um, so the first one is Scott and Lot, which is basically tax-based. And it's qualification by taxpayer status. Then we have something called Pot Walloper. Um, pot Walloper is somebody that it owns uh, their own their own pot and it boils their own pot of food at their own, own fireplace. So essentially, you're not homeless, and you're not living in a poor house. You have your place, and you live there, and you eat there. So that's it. You, your eligibility for voting was you were not on welfare. And there were a lot of people that were. Then you have. I'm, um, I'm 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 learning some glorious slang terms that I did I didn't even know with 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 which the British vernacular was furnished. I'm yeah. gonna have to use that against someone. You fucking pot walloper. Well, it's not a bad thing. It just means you own. Well, it doesn't even mean you own your home. It means you live. It means you're not on welfare. How dare you not be on welfare? Just like uh, Scott and Lot. Scott and Lot. Um, uh, Scott, if I remember right, was the rent, and Lot was the residence. So he basically... Oh, no, it was the tax, and Lot was the resident. Uh, then, if I'm pr pronouncing this right, I I've seen it pronounced two different ways, but the more common one I've seen is burgage. So that's what I'm going to say. So if it's pronounced differently than that, yeah, I'm this, sorry. This sounds about right, yeah. Um, Johnston describes burgage as land and or property tenure in a town for which payment was usually made to the king or a lord by the exchange of money rather than services. So by virtue of being a property renter from the the national government as opposed to from a, a being a subletter. So you might might rent a large area of land and then you put buildings on it, and you rent rooms in those buildings. Um, in some places, the people who rented those rooms might not be eligible to vote, but you were. Freeman Burroughs was uh, a freeman was a man who was not a noble or a serf. So basically, a regular commoner who was independent, financially independent. Um, and to be financially independent, you you had to have some level of obligation or employment. So as Johnson writes, when early boroughs were uh, granted chapters or charters, they many made reference to freemen who had to undertake municipal duties. So you had, as as a freeman, you had a city job. Um, and the status of freeman was incorporated into the rules governing the parliamentary franchise within some parliamentary boroughs. Then they had corporation boroughs. 
So something a lot of people don't understand, um, once incorporation was invented in, in uh, English common law, um, a corporation is just a, a legal entity that allows a group to act as a single entity. So if you have a business that is run by a board, you don't have, you know, uh, the 15 board members acting separately under the law. They vote on a course of action, and the legal entity that is the business, um, that that is the corporation, right? Uh, your city government is incorporated. Your co county government is incorporated. Your uh, state government is incorporated, and your federal or national government is incorporated. Each of those constitutes a corporation. So when people talk about government and corporate interests, they're saying corporate and corporate interests, just so you know. So corporation bros, um, basically the local government voted on who went to parliament. So the people didn't get to vote. Um, but the local government might be a town council that was voted on by the local people. So it used to be, um, there used to be similar, uh, sort of a similar setup uh, in the United States where uh, there were there were communities where you might have a local council that will vote for mayor. Um and, and so on. So there there were things like that have precedence here too. So in discussing um in, you know, in discussing this, this basically shows that where you lived determined how you might vote as a, a, in in your town or community. Uh then he went on and uh sort of described this this was a tougher thing to get through and I had to look in other sources for more information on this because it was he you know he was really um brief in his description of uh different um dif uh, different countries that that got included Scotland Wales and Ireland he didn't really get into Australia because uh, he was talking about earlier times um so Welsh uh, representation in Parliament, uh, regular Welsh representation in Parliament, dates back to the mid-16th century. So well after the um, uh, the the uh, forty shilling franchise, um, and he says it started in the last Parliament summoned by Edward II. Uh, in the reign of Henry the Third, the duty of sending a knight to the Shire. You notice he said duty of sending a knight to the Shire, a uh, knight of the Shire to Westminster, and paying for his expenses. So remember, I talked about the expense of travel. Was regarded as a financial burden. And uh, Welsh communities were not high-income communities. So this might be seen why, as why they were only required to send one member of Parliament at that time, um, and and that that was that that was a pattern at that point, and it's probably still uh, affected by that. Um, Ireland and Scotland are a complicated matter, <laughs> and I I the research I did on that um, I spent several hours. Uh, going through and and uh, writing things down and then not including them in this because they weren't directly related to the vote. They just helped me understand the things that were. So we're not going to get into all that history because that would be like a month's worth of shows. We'll just say for from the American perspective, like we can understand Ireland a little bit if you think about how the various tribes. Um, of, of Native Americans were kind of at war with each other and forming treaties and breaking them and so on for a long time prior t to uh, colonization by um, Britain and Spain here in France. Um, 
that's the Irish were kind of like that. They had uh, a lot of conflict going on and a lot of they were settling their differences and uh, Ireland and Scotland like like I said the the Scots were Irish before they were Scottish <laughs> so um but in, in but there there were conflicts that led to that as well so that's all historical and then then uh, you also had um a different system of nobility in Ireland where there was a high king and there were kings that were not the high king that were under the high king um so that sort of gives you a little bit that's about as much as you really need there but um Although, like I said earlier uh, Ireland hasn't had a king for many centuries many cause, many centuries yeah cuz cuz Ireland was uh, part of England for a for a very long time and they were under the rule of the of the English king yeah. which, is, which is why they came out of it as a, a republic uh, not that long ago yeah, and there was a lot of conflict there too with the the they they were not we'll just say it wasn't entirely consensual there was a there was a lot um but uh but yeah so one thing that's relevant um is Ireland's politics at the time during the time of King John were influenced by King John being an asshole um uh, then and then during Edward I's reign Irish uh, Irish par- parliament formed in 1297 um the uh, in terms of modern voting rights and the election standards uh it it seems like they started out with the 40 shilling franchise. Uh early on that was the full standard for the whole country. Um for for the county franchise and uh the borough franchise had the same sort of mix of voting qualifications as English boroughs um uh, because the idea of voting rights seems to have been introduced to Ireland by the English. One major difference was the disenfranchisement of the Catholics. And, uh, you know, here's where we get into when you have to deal with a a monarchy and a church state. And you have conflicts of religious belief and everything. Um, there, There's, you know, everybody knows the Irish history between Protestants and Catholics is also very complicated and... Uh, a very high conflict um there's there was there was a very long war there um so again i'm not going to get into the complexities um cuz that would that would that would take forever yeah but <laughs> but um there's two two things i can cite here uh from about 1692 to 1829 there's two different impacts, legal kind of impacts. Uh, of voters, Johnston states, the parliamentary franchise in the Irish uh, counties was specifically withheld from Roman Catholics by statute. So there was a law from 1727 to 1793 that effectively barred 80% of the male adult population in the counties of Ireland from exercising the vote, even if they qualified under other standards. Right, but even if they could have voted, they still wouldn't have been represented if they voted for a Catholic to serve as a member of Parliament, because in order to take their seats, the members of Parliament had to take an oath, abrogating the supremacy of the Pope, which they couldn't do, and to make a declaration that uh, transubstantiation did not occur at the Last Supper, which they couldn't do. So Catholic peers were summoned to Parliament, but they couldn't make the declaration, and from 1692 until uh, the Parliament's abolition in 1800, the Irish Parliament was Protestant. Strictly Protestant. So Catholics really had no representation, and they continued to be barred from sitting in the UK Parliament until... 1829, 
when the Roman Catholic Relief Act of 1829 uh, made it lawful for any Roman Catholic to sit and vote in either House of Parliament. So, uh, so that's that's kind of a, a sort of a sidebar there, but you know, nobody nobody seems to talk about the Roman Catholic uh, congregation, the um, public uh, public the the population right as being oppressed by this i wonder what had to happen for that change that's really interesting a lot of blood yeah that's what it sounds like <laughs> again yeah. voting rights being won by war a lot of blood um and and to be honest you know like i that that might be the part of the reason why uh, you know, we we hear about women being oppressed by not having the right to vote, uh, right? <laughs> but we don't hear about this actual codified into law exclusion, like in an oppressing actual Catholics, blood, an actual bloodshed. Yeah, <laughs> of the blood of the people that were trying to get the right to vote, not the blood right. of the people that they were trying to get it from. I mean, obviously both sides bled, but. Um, you know, the suffragettes didn't, you know, they whined right. a lot and they, they were force fed, but they, they didn't suffer the way that men suffer in war. Oh. So, yeah. So in terms of Scotland, I had to go to, um, the UK's parliament website there. Parliament UK explains that until the early 17th century, England and Scotland were two entirely independent kingdoms. Um, this changed dramatically in 1603 on the death of Elizabeth I. Uh, because the queen had died unmarried and childless, the English crown passed to the next available heir, her cousin James uh, VI. James the Sixth of yeah. Scotland, James the yeah. First of England. I'm like... Yeah. My every so often I'll see a word that has something like that, like the VI for the the six, and I'll look at it, and the I will disappear, and then my I'm looking at it, going, did I see that? Was that really there? And it'll come back, but I'm like, I that was there. I remember typing it. Sorry about that, guys. That's, and it, it I don't know what the, what does that. But it's there. Anyway, King of England, uh, or King of Scotland, England and Scotland now shared the same monarch under what was known as a Union of the Crowns. So um, that didn't unify the nations, but it did make them subject to the same monarch. So they, um, they still, there was, there was still conflict there. Another hundred years passed before they united under the 1706 Treaty of Union. Uh, since Scotland had its own parliament and system prior to that event, Johnston explains the method of election of the 45 MPs to serve in the House of Commons was left to the Scottish Parliament to determine. And uh, for the first time around, the, the first time around, they were chosen from sitting members um, of the Scottish Parliament to avoid elections in Scotland from producing an anti-union majority. So there was a, an establishment effort to protect the establishment involved there. So that's uh, one of the early instances, I guess, where you could say the establishment manipulated uh, the process that would have been the election process um, in order to protect its continued existence. Uh, after that, though, um, you, you saw the same 40 shilling freeholder uh, stipulation, and an estimate estimated one-tenth of one percent of the population could vote. Um, the borough electorate consisted of town councils, so what you had there was, again, People might vote for their council member, but the council members were voting for who would go to Parliament. Um, uh, except from 1469, the town council 
would appoint the next town council. So they quit voting for town councils, and it was a self-perpetuating system. So no voting rights, basically, in that situation. Uh, the original uh, variety of qualifications did have one thing in common. And this is something, like, we're we're at the end, I think, of my notes here. Uh, and this is something that, like, we've seen this theme throughout, right? So I'll read this last paragraph. They all excluded the lowest economic classes from having a degree of obligation to one's community and country, or, sorry, from having the right to vote, all based on the upper classes having a degree of obligation to one's community and country, uh, including answering the call for military service. So again, what do we hear from feminists all the time? Voting rights have never been attached to military service. Voting rights have always been attached. Prior to uh, women's voting rights, they were always attached to military service. Always. Johnston also noted that the county and borough franchise types had something in common. Whether county or borough seats, all elections were conducted in public. And votes were cast in public by each voter. Poll books were kept, and patrons could see who voted for each candidate. So in other words, not only was the civic obligation a, uh, a required condition for voting rights, and voting itself was considered a civic obligation as well, but the voters' choices as an obligor were public information. Because you were acting on behalf of the people, the people had the right to know how you acted. It was open to the judgment of your neighbors and the people under you, the people around you, including the women. Those on whose behalf the voter was casting the vote, as well as anyone else who might take an interest. So, for instance, the government knew who you voted for. Your lord knew who you voted for. The person who was sent to parliament knew who you voted for. Your church knew who you voted for. Your children. And so this is something we talked about a little bit in... We have a a Discord chat that's just us as a group um, in, the, that are involved in the production of HBR Talk. And uh, Allison pointed something out, um, and this is from from a, a book, Religious Poverty and the Profit Economy in Medi Medieval Europe. Um, she pointed out the keystone of feudal government was the personal agreement between lord and vassal to exchange protection for advice and military support. Uh, by the 12th century, this personal agreement began to be replaced by a money payment. Um, which was, again, that, that franchise. Uh, the old obligation of an annual 40-day period of military service was not practical uh, in new jurisdictions that embraced distances of 100 miles, but a knight could now fulfill his military obligation to the king uh, by paying scuttage, shield money, and his lord could uh, hire mercenaries when and where and for as long as he wanted. So even when the the vote started moving away from you must be involved in military service to to have voting rights, you essentially had to fund military service. So knights would do military service in exchange for influence and eventually that evolved into the concept of taxation. So even taxation evolved out of that that government protection racket. Um, and we were talking about uh, a practice that Allison had seen reference to called looking on during the, the time that the vote was public. Um, she couldn't find the reference where she had seen it before. Well, I found two. Uh, one of them is online. Um, it's... Uh, from, I want to say that's Virginia Tech. And 
Let me see if I can open that from our chat. But essentially, uh, it talked about it being done in the U.S., uh, the practice of looking on, and let me get to, I have to scroll up because I, I had forgotten about there being stuff at the bottom here. But, and then the other one is in a, in a book, and the relevant passages, I have screenshots of those that I think I'm just going to open the screenshots because it'll be easier to read. And the other screenshot is the references. But, um, oops, I didn't want to have that be that big. So, uh, this link, Voting Viva Voice, Unlocking the Social Logic of Past Politics, points out um, that for most of America's history, Voting was was a noisy public event, well attended. No private voting booths. Like when we think of going in to vote, like if I go in to vote, um, well, when I went in to vote in the in the primary, uh, we uh, you know you go in and they'll have an area with booths and they have an area where you prove you are who you say you are. And once you've proved you are who you say you are, you go to this booth with your your um, electronic card or your ticket. And uh, I, I do the paper ballot. So I, I take my paper ballot over there and insert it into the machine. And I, I mark my votes where only I can see the screen. And there's there's a... It used to be you would go in and you would draw a curtain. And you would punch out the mm -hmm. chads, right? I but, remember uh, that. Yeah. But it's got blinders on either side of the screen so nobody can see it but the person standing directly in front of the screen. Mm -hmm. And uh and then when I'm done, the voting card doesn't look like anything. It's just got, you know, marks on it. It doesn't have this is the person's name and and you marked next to the person's name and so on. If you just look at the card, you can't tell who voted or who they voted for, and you go feed it into another machine, and it counts it. Um, so it's uh, it's completely private, even though it's done communally. So we're all in there doing this. None of the other people in there can see who I voted for or what I voted for. But historically, voters stood in line, came forward from the crowd to vote. They often went up on a stage or a platform. And uh, were asked, you know, um, where what where they stood, and uh, they they stood in line, and they either voted by um, holding up a ticket, and you could tell who they were voting for based on the color of the ticket. Um, and in other states, they would uh, call out the name of the candidates that they wanted for for the office being contested. So the clerks would then enter their choices in a poll book. So they either had to speak it or show it. And everybody could see it. And everybody and so could hear it. When, when you steal from men uh, on behalf of what we call democracy, you can call it taxation but it's still theft calling it a different name doesn't make it a different thing just like saying that a, a, a dog's tail is a fifth leg doesn't mean a dog is a five-legged animal things are still what they are even if you call them a different thing and if you um if you sacrifice men's lives uh for the sake of what you call democracy or military subscription it's still, uh, what would the word be? It'd be murder, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. it's, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is still uh, murder. And it has been, not just for the last century or so, but for the last millennium or so, and, and the rest, because it's been going on since ancient times. And you can refer to democracy as uh, uh, a wolf and three sheep or whatever it is 
a, a, a lion and a tiger and a sheep deciding what's for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, you can do you, you can do that whole metaphor, but then you consider all of the shrews. Shall we call them shrews, as in the taming of the shrew? I think we should call them shrews. The the, the, the bunch of shrews living underneath the cage, uh, with 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 no worry of being eaten by anyone ever. And you can totally ignore those shrews when you create this metaphor and you create whatever words that would that, that we put behind this metaphor. The, the point is, you, you can say that most of them had no influence over who gets eaten for breakfast. But as long as they're all underneath the fucking floor, where there's no chance of them ever getting eaten, then uh, then it, it's, it's kind of a moot point, especially at the point at which the shrews get to decide who gets eaten for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> at, that point, at that point, it doesn't matter if it's the lion or the tiger or the sheep or who else. Because the shrews aren't going to get eaten. We have a system in place whereby all the shrews in the world can exist and nobody ever eats them, which is weird for a shrew. <laughs> yep. That's why we need to bring in the owls. But, uh... <laughs> oh, that, that's not a good reference. Um, I, will, I, I will point out... The, the big thing that this establishes in terms of the looking on, and it, and it's this image says pretty much the same thing in terms of uh, UK voting. If the women of a community didn't like how you voted, they didn't just sit around and be like, gosh, that guy voted in a way I didn't like. Right? Women have always been vocal. They didn't keep their mouths shut. They would yell. Hmm. They, would, they would get violent. Um, we've demonstrated a history of female violence uh, through various uh, historical references that we have made during various episodes of this show. And I mean, I even have a whole video on the Honey Badger radio channel that um, gives you an hour-long explanation of the evolution of domestic violence law uh, and how it it, it both acknowledged and excluded government response to domestic violence committed by wives. So, uh, so there is that, right? And, uh, you know, Allison pointed out in our chat, like, imagine if this style of election was done today. So you have, uh, instead of going into that secret voting booth and using your secret ballot to cast votes that nobody will know you were the one that cast those votes. You know, like, throw that out in the trash, and instead, when you go in to vote for president in the United States, and say 2016, and then again in 2020, and now this year, you have to walk up on a stage in front of all of the people in your local neighborhood, in your local community, and they're going to ask you who you vote for, and either they're going to give you a red ticket and a blue ticket, and you decide, you know, or and a green ticket and whatever color we want, maybe a pink ticket, um, <laughs> and you put the ticket in, in the ballot box, the clear ballot box, the glass ballot box that everybody can see what color ticket you put in there, so they know if you voted for Trump or for somebody else, right? And, and, or they ask you point blank, what's the name of the person you vote for? And you have to say the name. And all of the people in the community can then confront you afterward because you have to walk back down into that crowd when you're done. How that would change the election process. So, uh, in the the other reference is uh, a book on Victorian um, political culture. There's more to the name of it. It's v Victorian political culture, uh, poverty, or something along those lines. Um, it it was more than just that as the title, but uh, 
that's what it says at the top of the page, and it's what it shows in the link. It doesn't show the whole name of the book. Um, voting entailed the manly discharging of a communal responsibility in the presence of polling clerks. So it was done in public because the voter was voting as a form of taking responsibility for the community and his voting presence was based on his obligation to the community. Right? Votes were then recorded in poll books available in theory to scrutiny. So again, you, you know, it, let's say um, a local minister, bishop, cardinal, pope, the pope uh, decided that they wanted to check and see who all voted for the opposition to the the um, positions of the church and uh, maybe target you for uh, exclusion or punishment because the church could do that historically. Couldn't do it today, but historically, you know, there there was quite a bit of punishment handed down by the church. Um, they could look and see. And you were, your name would be in there, and who you voted for would be in there. So the public character of these election rituals affirmed the communal rather than private nature of the franchise in the voting process. Women, when we, we got our right to vote, the women who demanded that right to vote did not demand it as a, a, a form of social obligation, uh, a service to their community. They demanded it as an individual right, a privilege. Very different. Um, the protocols of canvassing uh, respected the status of the candidate and the voter. So when they uh, ran for election, they were not advertising, you know, to the individual, here's what you want. I'm giving you what you want. It was more like advertising, you know, choosy mothers, choose Jeff, uh, and sl slogans like that. I will do these things for the people that you're responsible for. I will help your community in these ways. I will be, I will take responsibility for your community in these ways. Um... The active participation of non-electors in the rituals of the, the nomination and the hustings referred to in contemporary parlance as looking on involved women as well as unfranchised males. And then it goes on to say in uh, Whitehaven 1832, for example, female Tory supporters tore down the flag of their Whig opponents and assaulted four apprentice carpenters. In electoral politics of Carlisle during the 1830s and 1840s, the Female Radical Association played an important part in Chartist campaigns. It was claimed that non-electors won the 1852 election in uh, Stoke-on-Trent for the Whig Edward Levinson Grower, um, brother of Lord Granville, by threatening politicians and shoekeepers with the withdrawal of their custom. We'll boycott you, leading to the defeat of the incumbent conservative MP William Copeland. So women participated even before they were obligated or given the right to participate in the franchise. Women influenced the outcomes of elections and they had a great deal of power. They were the ones that decided how the household spending happened, right? They were the ones who would boycott if they didn't get what they want. And they could engage in violence. And uh, guess who didn't go to jail for that? women. But, uh, you know, those, those voting processes were still written in men's blood. So there you have it. That's as far as I wanted to talk on it today. Um, I don't know, did, do you guys have anything else that you want to Add in. We, we got we got through the article. We're not going to do it next week as well, are we? Well, we're, there won't be this same article, but and it's I guess it's not really an article so much as a, like I said, it's show notes. I will have more notes. We'll talk a little bit about some more changes next week. Might be a much shorter show um, because there wasn't, from what I saw, there wasn't a lot that changed, but there are some things that happen, and we do need to get to where um, 
voting rights were extended to men on other bases besides land ownership and stuff. Uh, but uh, and and how different it was when the common man got his voting rights versus women getting theirs. Um, but uh, but that's all. And it if it takes me too long to research it, I might put in another article and discuss that article with with everybody next week <coughs> while I'm still doing the the work. Um, but uh, but we will have more discussion about suffrage before we move on to anything else. Um, uh, unless, no, I, like I said, I, I don't get the homework done in time. <laughs> I, I've got nothing to complain about, really. In, in most weeks, we have some bullshit feminist articles yeah. to, to read through. This week, we just we, we, we just had some fairly sensible notes to get through. So, yeah, give, it, give us some more sensible notes next week. <laughs> I will do my best. Um, like the, the, the rough thing. Yeah. If I get into the history of banking, Jan, we're going to have <laughs> a little discussion there. But, um, especially when we start getting into the 20th century and that there's a scam, the banks have been running since the civil rights era that everybody really needs to know about. I might have to do that. Um, but, uh, in any case that, that'll be it then for the main body of the episode. Let's get into... Let's see, we have at least one more Super Chow. Doo -doo -doo -doo. The one good man gave us $5 and said, Is anyone else up for having another go at strange women lying in ponds distributing swords? <laughs> you give me a sword, I'm not getting into a pond and giving it away. I'm keeping that. That's that's mine. <laughs> Some watery tart distributing swords is no system of government. <laughs> system of government. Oh, oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see what else we have here. That was our super chow. Did we have another super chat? No. All right. So no more super chats. Um, do do do. And I don't see any rumble rants that were paid. So. Uh, and then oh, so we did have um. Yeah, the change. Uh, Betty Adams added some things about Catholics holding power. She said the change allowing Catholics to hold power was mostly due to the fading political power of Rome. Um, the separation of church and state was a growing idea in 19th century England. If there is little or no chance of the government forcing you to do religion, who cares what is the religion of the persons in power? So that is an interesting thing. They really didn't stop oppressing Catholics by withholding voting rights from them because it was wrong <laughs> to oppress them. It was because they had their church had lost power, and that is true. And at some at some point during the discussion, I'm probably going to have to get into all of that too, which means I'm going to have to explain. Um, the change from the church being the primary source of uh, economic care for the poor to the state being the primary source of economic care for the poor because that combined with more um, more poor voting rights and more female voting rights is what led to you know previously the arrangement of taxation between national government and the taxpayer was you agree to be ready to participate in some military service for me and to pay me some some tax money some some shield money so that I can fund other military um, fulfillment if I'm too far away from you and do some other housekeeping in the country like making sure that there's travelable travelable roads traversable roads so that you can send uh representatives to the great council and so on and uh and I will fulfill my obligations to you on the basis of that agreement by making sure that the country is defended and uh law and order is kept and we have roads and that agreement was 
a consensual agreement between the king's vassals, the lords and, and barons, and the king, uh, or the lord and baron's vassals and the lord and baron. And and, then... yeah, the, and the idea of having a pope and admirals and bishops is highly analogous to the yeah. idea of, of having a king and, and barons and whatnot. And I'm fine with that. Oh, yeah. Because they don't have all that much power over us. They only have any power over us if we believe in, in the same doctrine as they do. And as long as they can't enforce that doctrine over us, not not by force, but just by... Uh, ideological right. coercion, then I'm, I'm fine with that because I don't have to do shit about you know, the, the, your, the coercion of your ideology because I, I don't really give a shit about it. Right. It's a good place to start, if nothing else. Yeah, it is. And so it's interesting. Just that structure is an interesting structure. But yeah, initially that the whole idea of taxation, taxation and uh, civic obligation. Those were essentially agreements made between the king and his vassals, uh, where today your neighbors can vote for you to face civic, civic obligation and taxation that you didn't agree to, uh, and you're not getting anything in return for it. So that's part of what we're going to end up having to cover more of like next next uh episode next episode on the vote you know is how did we get from the point where those concepts were um in intrinsically interwoven that you didn't have taxation and military obligation without uh a, a service agreement with your monarch your 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 national government that your national government uh, provided things that it was in your interest to support, um, where now you do. You do have those sta so same obligations as a man, uh, but you don't necessarily have an interest in most of what your national government is doing. Um, like, you could do without most of what your national government does, and in fact, quite a bit of it is to your detriment. Uh, so... This this could be um, maybe partly why the uh, three-letter agencies in the federal government of the United States do not like people like me. Um, <laughs> just saying. But in any case, so that's that's it. Um, that's all of our super chats, super chows, and and, uh, and thanks Betty for those comments on the church because that does that is a a very salient point there. Um, it's rather important to to note that uh, actually that they weren't just writing a wrong. Um, they 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 weren't threatened anymore by the idea of the church being imposed because uh, the church didn't have that level of power anymore. And I do need to um, talk about that a little further the next time and and talk about it in conjunction with that transfer of obligation. Um, as well, because that that's something that fundamentally changed the relationship between government, the people, voting, and taxation. So with that, thanks everybody for listening. This probably has been, it may have been an exciting episode for some, but it's probably dry for a lot of people. Um, Hopefully everybody, though, did get the, the main point that I wanted to get across of how voting from the beginning, not just in times of modern, you know, drafting and going to war with other countries, but from the beginning, voting was actually a, an, a, a, an evolved outreach of male obligation. Uh, and uh, thanks to uh, everybody who... Uh, works in the background to make HBR yeah, talk and, happen and, and, and my I, two co-hosts I would remind you first of all rule Britannia second of all Britannia rules the waves third of all Britons never 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 will be slaves there we go and good night all men's right activists are machines 
dude, okay? They are literal machines. They are talking point machines. They are impossible to fucking deal with, especially if you have like, especially if you have like a, a couple dudes who have good memory on top of that too. Holy shit, you're fucked.